For the sake of exams, do we go with the Armitage 1999 classification of periodontal disease or are we supposed to learn the brand new classification and go with that? If you don't know the answer to this question and you're worried about your exam, stay tuned. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Reza Rutseri. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Education here at the School of Dentistry, University of Manchester. If you have not done so and you haven't subscribed to our channel, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and also click on the bell button so you get notified whenever a new video is coming out. This week, our BDSR3 students were very busy with their clinical skills gateway exams. I'm going to leave you with Dr. Mark Schupak to tell you about how the exam went and for the majority of you, what you have to go ahead and do to improve your techniques. So welcome year three, you did the clinical skills test um, for the metalloceramic crown, upper left five. Well done those of you that passed. Those of you that didn't, there are some common threads of errors, mainly holding the burr parallel to the long axis for the tooth so you don't over taper the tooth, don't over reduce. Make sure you've got the buccal shoulder which is adequate Remember, you're dealing with two materials, metal and porcelain, so you need 1.2, 1.5 millimeters, a decent shoulder. And the main thing is tidy up the prep afterwards and make sure you've got clues load reduction as well. You can practice for the resets, and then we have the resets coming up sometime in the next few weeks, which can, we're fairly flexible at the timetabling of that. If you need anybody, anyone needs to do extra sessions, usually you can ask Kate McGill and whoever, whichever tutor's there to make sure they're happy to supervise you. And uh, then, it's really a question of practicing, getting crits, uh, and trying to just get it good enough so no undercuts, the right reduction, the right kind of tapering, and then you can get through. So a very common question we get asked is which classification of periodontal disease you have to follow for your exams. I'm going to leave you with experts to tell you all about what you need to know. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Rosari. Mm -hmm. So I have one joke today and um, that is that there was a big meeting multi-million pound contract and somebody said how long is this going to take and he said it's going to take six months it's six months can't wait six months he said uh, i was thinking more of weeks he said okay 26 weeks then <laughs> and uh, i also have to dispel some rumors that i color my hair it's not colorant it's a shampoo it's called l'oreal silver for those uh, rather grey uh, silver foxes in society. I, of course, no, use no shampoo on my head. I just use Mr Sheen. So I've got Kevin Seymour in my office today and I'm going to grill him. I'm going to grill him hard on some issues around the periodontal classification. So, Kevin, tell us about this new classification. What's it all about? I think we have to um, sort of bear in mind that, that um, aggressive periodontitis, <coughs> excuse me, and chronic periodontitis, as we used to term them, are just part of the spectrum of periodontal disease and that the diagnosis of our patients now under the new classification is one of periodontitis not one of chronic periodontitis or aggressive periodontitis it's one of periodontitis and so being able to stage and grade the, the disease that we've diagnosed is very helpful in terms of looking at where the patient is on this on that particular spectrum not it is, it is indicative for treatment as well but also a great way for us to communicate with each other and follow patients through their treatment, particularly now that we're able to classify disease being stable or unstable or in remission. And there's also a, a, a portion of the, of the new classification to talk about risk factor as well. And we still are able to call it generalised or localised and also molar or molar and incisor pattern. So I think in that respect it's very helpful. It's taken me as an older clinician quite a while to get used to it. Yes, there's absolutely no doubt you'd be considered old. No doubt, uh, but fortunately my younger colleagues have taken it on board a lot quicker than I have. Kevin, do you think the students should be using this? They should be now moving forward and um, we produced some slides uh, and presentation for WAFA for student use and that should be on Blackboard. Yeah. Also Seema from GSK came and spoke to every year group yeah. um, and she gave the slides that have been approved by the BSP for, and also we've got all the laminated sheets from the British Society of Periodontology um, for students to use as a, as a cheat sheet. And how about the tutors as well? Again, we should all be using it now because it should be widespread in general practice. 
Lots of you guys are panicking about the observed and written milestones. How about if I leave you with Dr. Dixon so she can tell you all about this? Hi there, my name is Carly Dixon. I'm planning to come to the Year 2 lecture on Monday to give them an overview about milestones and answer any of those questions that you might be having um, and hopefully get you on your way of completing those milestones and running through. For the Years 3 and 4, um, I'll be popping in again to provide updates on milestones just to make sure that you're all happy with how it's progressing. And we really want you to be taking those opportunities to submit them when you feel ready. Even if it's not a successful outcome, really important still to submit it because it's showing that you're having that active progress uh, and you're trying to complete them. We have updated the handbook of assessments, um, so if you want to download and have a little look, we've also greyed out areas for that might not be required for your year. For example, if you're in year four and there have been new milestones that have been added in year three and year two, these have been greyed out. So just give a bit of further clarification of what you might need to do for your milestones. And again, if you've got any questions or concerns, just drop me an email and I'll be more than happy to help. And of course, a gentle reminder about all the wonderful MDSS activities. How about I leave you with Tara to tell you about the next upcoming event. Next week on the Wednesday the 27th of November we'll be having our MDSS trade fair. So make sure you pop along to get all these freebies. Now I can tell you that most of my BDS year 2 students are super excited to see their first real patients next week. Are they nervous? I don't know. Uh, but how about I leave you with Dr. Mark Cohen to tell you a little bit about how to prepare yourself for that big day. Hello, my name is Mark Cohen. Congratulations to all of our second year BDS students who have reached an important milestone in their training. This week, they started to meet and treat their first dental patient. This has brought together the last one and a half years of training to reach this goal. While most Year 2 students have been able to obtain a first patient, unfortunately there are some who are still without. Your first port of call is to contact Donald on the student booking desk and see if he can find somebody on the waiting list. Failing that, uh, it's important to contact members of your intercalated team, either via email, or perhaps more effectively, is to contact them directly on the clinic where they may well be able to transfer the patient over to you uh, at that time. In addition, when your patient does arrive, go out to the waiting area and greet your patient personally. Try and obtain a handshake from their patient and then escort them to the bay where there should be a happy, smiling nurse sitting in the bay, not chatting to their friends around. In addition to that, once the patient is sat comfortably in the chair, Set up your personal protective equipment as you've been taught and as you do in all other sessions. Face the patient when talking to them and obtaining their history using an open, friendly posture. If you have any complications at any time, then you'll call over your tutor who will assist. They will introduce themselves to the patient and attempt to alleviate any problems. And finally, all the year tutors wish the students well over the next semester when they will continue with the stabilisation and preventative phase of their patient's dental needs. And as a special thanks and apology has to go to the Year 2 student from last year, who confidently proceeded with her second patient injection. When on completion, she came running to me in a panic, explaining that the injection site was bleeding. Thank you for identifying this as I had inadvertently admitted this as one of the possible post-operative complications to local anaesthetic and I have now included this in my cl clinical delivery of lectures. Thank you for that. While I was filming this episode of Manchester Molars, I had a little delivery. Let me share that with you. And I've got a sweatshirt of the MDSS. How cool is that? So on the front, I've got the University of Manchester and the School of Dentistry. On the back, we've got the logo of the MDSS and on the sleeves, we've got Crest of the University of Manchester and the sponsors who are looking after our MDSS and the most amazing part, I've got my name on the sleeve. So I'm super excited to try this on and I think it looks great. It's the same purple of the University of Manchester, I love it and also it's got my name on it, how cool is that? There we go guys, you had it. This was your week's Manchester Molars, this was my brand new sweatshirt and I love this. I've been Rosa Ruzzelli, you have been amazing, I will see you next week.